crew, and uh, I'm going to continue uh, my series on the new normal. Have you heard that term, the new normal? Well, the world's talking about what life is going to be like after the pandemic. That's what that word actually means. Uh, what uh, is the state of our society? How's it going to settle out after this pandemic? Well, I'm more concerned about what, how's the church going to be different after this pandemic? Because you know what happens in a crisis? God shows up. Just like the three Hebrew boys in the fire, that fourth person showed up. It was God. Jesus showed up. Even to the point to where that evil King Nebuchadnezzar knew it was God. Is it possible that the result of this pandemic is going to be the church emerging, waking up? Somebody say, wake up. Yeah. All the way in the back. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Is it possible that we're going to get better because we've been tested and we've passed the test? So today I want to talk to you about the fact that you are called by God. You are called by God. Last week I was saying I believe that the effects of this pandemic is going to take the church from religion to relationship. You know, when you have a need and you're calling upon God in the midst of your need... Some of us went through the pandemic, you know, had COVID, whatever. Did it take you on your knees a little bit? Did you pray a little more? Probably. And so what happens is we have a, a, a closer connection with God in the midst of a storm. And so what I believe in all the darkness, like in the dark storm that we've gone through, there's a light coming through the clouds. And that's going to be the influence the testimony of the church, that's you and me. Our testimony is going to be seen more clearly. It says you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You like those words? You're chosen. Jesus said, you didn't choose me, I chose you. You know, God's pursuing you and just won't let you get away. Well, you know, we read in the Bible that there's people that have been chosen and uh, we sometimes say, well, those were heroes. You got Abraham, you got Moses. Remember the burning bush where God spoke out of the burning bush? Moses, take off your shoes. You're standing on holy ground. Wow, if I received a call like that, my life would be different, right? But you know, we've all received the call of God. When you were conceived and birthed into this world, you were no accident. Conception and birth is a miracle of God. You got to know that. Man cannot create life. Only God does. And so you might not feel like a superhero, but imagine this. The creator of the universe who spoke the earth and the light and the darkness, uh, the waters into existence, he decided that you should be conceived and be living at such a time as this. So I think the more that we understand that we are called, the stronger we become. I like this verse, the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 26. He says, for ye see your calling, brethren, do you see your calling? I'm going to try to help you with that today. That not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Oh, I just want to read a little bit further in that passage here. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 26. It says, here it is. It says, and he's chosen the base things of the world and things which are despised has God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught Things that are. Listen to this. For verse 29, it says that no flesh should glory in his presence. So you know what? If you feel like you're weak, listen, in your weakness, God is strong. And you have a calling of God. And I think the more that you rise up, even in your weakness, uh, people are, your friends are going to see you and say, I, I can't believe it, what God's doing in your life. I can't believe it. You've gotten so strong. You've gotten so together. Anybody ready to increase in these last days? We need the church to increase. Amen? 
So we see Jesus. I want you to turn to Luke chapter 5, if you would. I, I like this story of how Jesus calls Peter. And uh, I'm going to read you the whole account of it when Jesus told Peter to launch out into the deep. Say that with me. Launch out into the deep. Some of you that do fishing uh, here in the church, and I, I know who you are. You like to go out deep sea fishing. You know that you got to go out till, till you find deep water. And in the Gulf of Mexico, you were out recently there, Bobby. You literally got to go out 40 miles to find 100 feet of water so you can get the big grouper, you know, the big fish. Well, we've got to launch out into the deep, spiritually speaking, and uh, get out there and really expect more from God because we got God working on our behalf. He says, let down your nets for a catch. I'm going to read the story to you, but first I'm going to take the opportunity to just show you a little clip from the movie. This is a movie that came out in 2014, Son of God. And when I saw this part of the movie, I actually cried out in the theater. But watch this. I think you'll enjoy it. I got to tell you, when I saw this in the theater, when he said that, I, I literally cried out, yes, you know, I'm just so caught up in it. But I, I love that when um, Jesus says to Peter, just give me an hour of your time and I'm going to give you a whole new life. And Peter says, what makes you think I want one? Hey, listen, I want you to want one. You can just drag through life, you know, bummed and burdened and depressed, or you can decide I'm called of God, the creator of the universe, and I'm going to make a difference. I'm going to change the world. Any world changers out there? <laughs> David on the front row. Yes, we're going to change the world. I mean, we don't want to go through life just all bummed out. Man, get off on the other side of that bed. Wake up and smell the roses. God's got a plan for your life. Let's read the story. I want to read it for you in Luke 5. Beginning with verse 1, it says, And it came to pass one day, it's coming to pass this day in your life. It says that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood off the Sea of Galilee, and he saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them. They were washing their net. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon Peter's, and he prayed that he would thrust out just a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the ship. And when he had left speaking, when he was done, he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered and said unto him, Master, we've toiled all night, but we've taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were at the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both ships so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I'm a sinful man. And he was astonished. And all that were with him at the catch of fishes that they had taken... And so also was James and John, the sons of Zebedee, and were partners. They were partners of Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, for henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. Woo, what a story. What a story. I want to show you some things that I pull out of this that I think will be life-changing for you about the call of God that's upon your life. Number one, God knows where you are. You know, not just geographically, but spiritually, emotionally. He knows where you're at. You know, I mean, he's calling Peter, and, and Peter, he's, he's sarcastic. You know, he's discouraged. You know, the fish aren't biting during the day. Oh, the fish never bite here. You know, I mean, he's got that kind of attitude. God, he knows where you are. And he still, he still calls you. You know, it's amazing to me, history tells us that around the Sea of Galilee in those days, there, there, there might have been over 4,000 ships. But this account 
is that Jesus intentionally, deliberately picked out Peter's boat, picked out Peter's. Eight billion people in the world today, and God has got a plan for your life. Think about that. Think about that. He knows you by name, the Bible says. He, the very hairs of your head are numbered. And uh, I, I like in the little movie clip there, which isn't exactly according to the word, but when uh, Peter says uh, uh, there's, there, there's no fish out there and I see that smirk on Jesus' face that says, well, wait and see. You know, um, just, uh, you know, live and learn. <laughs> I mean, many times God's got that attitude towards us that we just need a miracle in order to increase our faith. You know, as uh, I was receiving the offering, I was thinking about the time when this church had a, a very big need. And um, I didn't know how God was going to provide it. And in fact, it was $100,000 that we had a need for. And uh, I, I remember feeling the weight of that, you know, and... Um, I remember praying, but not feeling like God really understood the weight of that need. God, you don't really realize how serious this is, you know. But the thing that I'll never forget is how God met that need in such an unexpected way. I mean, there was a, a letter that came in the mail in just a white envelope, nothing that I had asked for. I didn't send out a letter and ask for help or anything, just... God spoke to somebody who came into a large amount of money and uh, uh, was, was, was given away stock and sent us a stock certificate. And uh, I got it in the mail. And uh, in fact, my dad got it in the mail and uh, handed it to me and said, uh, got this in the mail. And uh, I said, well, do you know how much it's worth? And he said, no, not really. I haven't checked. So I'm unbelievingly, you know, going online to find out, you know, what it was worth. Just a little bit over $100,000. One person that God used to meet that need. And I'm going to tell you, God knows where you are in every step of your life. Why not just put God in control and let him work things out? So that's my little story. Here's the second thing that I see in this story, and even the, the movie clip pulls this out. God's pursuing you. You know, he asked, uh, Jesus asked Peter, you need any help? No, I don't need any help, you know. And then Jesus just steps into the water and comes down. He says, hey, what are you doing? You can't just climb into my boat, you know. Let me tell you, like it or not, Greg, like it or not, <laughs> God is pursuing you. He knows where you are. And he's just always after. You remember the story of the prodigal son and how when the son decided to start coming home, his father was out there looking for him, watching for him every day and saw him from a distance. That's how intent God is watching your lives. He knows where you're at and he's just pursuing you. He wants to get into your boat. And I like this verse here in 2 Chronicles 16, 9 says, the eyes of the Lord. Don't you love it that God has eyes and he's watching over us. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose hearts are fully committed to him. You know, if you've got children and you're praying for them, we were praying for uh, the children here earlier in the service or grandchildren let me tell you, God's pursuing them too. You just sick the Holy Spirit on them. You know, when I was growing up, uh, raised in a Christian home, my parents were ministers, pastors, and uh, yet I was out there experimenting with the world like a lot of kids do. I mean, you've got your, 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 your friends at school. And so um, I remember my parents were away and I was out late one night and uh, you know, doing things with my friends that I shouldn't have been doing. And we ended up having a terrible car accident. I mean, it should have killed all of us. It was in my high school uh, senior year and in the middle of the night. And, uh, you know, I, I was 
surprised, you know, when the, we came to that abrupt crashing conclusion uh, that uh, we were all alive. I, in fact, I asked, is everybody okay? I was the first one to speak. We climbed out of a car that was totally smashed. The, the engine was in the front seat. And there's four of us in that car. The, a telephone pole had come down on top of us, crushing the roof down. We had to crawl out. And at that time, there was, there was gasoline all over the car. I mean, it could have crashed and burned. I'll never forget this, though, that when we're walking away from that crash scene in the middle of the night, my friends were saying to me, Phil, I think the only reason we got out of this crash alive is because your dad is a preacher. I'm telling you, I felt convicted because I wasn't being a very good example to my friends, but somehow they had that sense that they were safe with me. You know, I'm telling you, it made a, it made a, it challenged my life because I knew that God was just not going to let me get away with anything. In fact, we hit the transformer that put all the lights out in Samoset. And so it was in the news the next morning. So my parents had to find out, you know, I mean, <laughs> you know, God just loves you too much and loves your children too much to leave them alone. So think about that. God knows where you're at and he's pursuing you and he's instructing you. Now, when we're not walking with God, we're not hearing his voice perhaps, but even when you're walking with God, sometimes you don't hear very well. I'm pointing out the scripture here. When Jesus instructed Peter to let down your nets for a catch, Peter's response was, he says, uh, Master, we've toiled all night and we've taken nothing. Nevertheless, I heard you preach. And uh, at their word, I will let down a net. Not all my nets, just a net. It's interesting in Scripture, Jesus tells him to let down the nets. I'm going to tell you, partial obedience is disobedience. <laughs> but God, in his grace, he still gave them some... Uh, uh, return some harvest but imagine that god gives us an instruction and if we'll just obey god is not moved by our need he's always moved by our faith if we'll trust him trust him to bring it to pass you know he's got a great harvest in mind more than enough ephesians 3 20 god is able to do ab abundantly exceedingly abundantly above all that we can even think or ask. That's what God has on his mind. He just wants us to be obedient, you know. In fact, uh, we were receiving the offering, talking about the tithe, and out of Malachi 3, God says, prove me in this, test me in this, and, and, and just give with my instruction, giving the tithe. Just give and see if I won't open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that's more than what you can receive. And that's what happened here. The scripture says, even to where the boats were sinking, I mean, so full of fish. And fish in their economy, that was money. That was money. That was going to take care of their crew for a long time. So I just love the fact that the call of God is more than just a burning bush. But really, what God wants to do is he wants to fill your nets. He wants to make your life stand out. I'm believing that the new normal for the body of Christ is going to be prosperity. Not so we can heap it on ourselves, but so we can be givers. So that we can do more for the kingdom of God. You know, I have another vision. We've been giving uh, the missions more heavily. And uh, this week, of course, we're giving into the lives of our children. But... Uh, one of our dear friends in the Bahamas, uh, that's uh, Pastor Henry and Ann Higgins. You know, they're going to be back this year for the Feast of Tabernacles, but they have a need to purchase a van for their ministry. And they have a school for children, and they need this van. And we're going to help them purchase a van. They're only asking $5,000, and I think they've raised half of that. So we're going to help them. I, I just consider it an honor because God has filled our nets. Amen, somebody? 
Here's the fourth thing. Uh, he's not only instructing you, but I want you to see this in this account too. God is convicting you. Now, conviction is not condemnation. But it's interesting to me, whenever God shows up, people feel conviction. Conviction. Here's where Peter said, Lord, when he saw the miracle, he said, Lord, depart from me. I'm not worthy of this. I'm a sinful man. That's conviction. But you know, God wants to prove to you what he can do. God wants to show up in our lives and say, listen, your life is not your own. It's more than that. Prove me. I'm going to prove you. And uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's a blessing for us to see those kinds of miracles in our lives. It, it's convicting. It makes us want to live stronger for God. Amen. When God does something in your life, you want to live stronger for him. So he's convicting you, not condemning you. Conviction awakens you to truth to set you free, to make you live stronger for God. So God, show up in our lives. And Lord, when you do, Lord, convict us to where we're growing and increasing in our walk with you. I'm going to close on this. God is commissioning you. You know, this is really what God has on his mind. Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. I'll make you interested in my business. You know, that's, that's all of the reason why we're here. Otherwise, could God could get us saved and just take us to heaven. But no, he's got an assignment on our lives here on earth. And listen, your children, your grandchildren, they're the first assignment that you have. Those that are under your roof, your spouse, to show the love of Christ to those that are closest to you. So next week, uh, I'm going to talk to you. Next week is Father's Day. And I'm going to talk to you uh, about how to be a fisher of men. I'm going to talk to you about fishing. You know, um, you need to know how to bait a hook. Okay? Uh, you need to know, in fact, how to tie a hook. Because many times you're fishing. You fisher guys know this that uh, you lose your hook, you got to tie another one. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you learn something and bring a spiritual truth on that next week because we have to accept the commission that God has upon our lives. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Let's just review what we've learned here. In God's call, always remember, he's called you, he knows right where you're at. You can't say, well, God, I don't measure up. I'm not worthy of your call. No, he knows exactly where you're at. And he's pursuing you. You can't hide from God. You can run, but you can't hide. You know, I mean, he will chase you down. And that's why I like to sick the Holy Spirit on people that are running. And God's instructing you. And remember this, if you obey God, there's always a reward for obedience. It's just the way God's word works. Allow the conviction of God to bring increase in your life. You know, it's interesting to me, and uh, I won't take a lot of time in this, but this same layout of how God works in our lives can be found in John 21. You know that Peter, even though he walked with Jesus three and a half years, he saw Jesus after the resurrection. He got discouraged and he said, I'm going back fishing. This whole chapter talks about that. But do you know that uh, Jesus pursued him again? He, he showed himself. He ended up walking again on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And uh, he calls out to them. Of course, Peter, when he said he's going fishing, he took some of the disciples with him. And I'm going to say that about you. Every one of you, you have leadership. Somebody's following you. And they're back in the boat, fishing, going back to their old occupation when they were called to carry on the ministry of Jesus. So Jesus calls out to them, hey, guys, have you caught anything? They said, no. You know, the grass is not greener on the other side. If you, if you decide you get discouraged and you decide you're going to just go a different direction than following Christ, you're not going to catch more fish. There's no better way to live. He said, no. He said, well, look, guys, 
cast your nets on the other side, on the right side. Choose to live for God, even through that place of discouragement. You know, they didn't even recognize Jesus. The Bible says they were only 100 yards off the shore. But the Bible says then that they took in such a catch of fish, and it specifically says 153 large fish that they caught. And then John said, it's the Lord. They recognized him for the miracles. And Peter jumps off the front of the boat. I just have a, a picture of that here. When they're pulling in the, the fish, Peter jumping off the front of the boat, swimming to shore. Oh, God likes that kind of enthusiasm when we want to follow him that way. Just amazed at how they got that picture back in those days and I got a hold of it, right? But uh, I want you to see this because it's so important that we understand that, you know, the rest of that story was Jesus was literally fixing breakfast for them. And he said, come and dine. Jesus, he didn't need their fish. He's got, he doesn't need your money. But he just needs our obedience. And uh, it was in this story that Jesus then commissioned, recommissioned Peter said, Peter, do you love me more than fishing? Do you love me more than this? Maybe looking at the fish. Peter said, yeah, you know I love you. Three times Jesus asked him, and then he commissioned him. He said, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Do what's important to me. I want you to close your eyes with me today. This uh, particular instruction that Jesus gave Peter that day when he called him, cast your net on the right side of the ship and you shall find. I, I want to encourage you today to make that decision in this post-pandemic world and decide to, to, to be attached to the purpose of God. He's got a call upon your life and he'll chase you down. He'll try to get your attention. But you know what? If you just turn around, he's there. And your life will be so much more exciting to live when you know you're, you're walking in the assignment of God upon your life. You might be watching today or maybe here in the sanctuary and you're not sure where you stand with God. Well, the first step is just to say yes and say, Lord, I want to follow you. Yes, I want to follow you. And you receive him into your heart and he takes away your sins and gives you eyes to see and ears to hear and a whole new life. I'm telling you today, church, God has a call upon your life too. And he wants your life to be fruitful and effective and to bring forth increase to everything and everyone around you. Put your hand on your heart with me right now. Father, today I ask you to look into each of our hearts and Lord, see the desire that we have to follow you. Lord, we want to say yes to that call. If you want to say yes to the call of God, just say it with me. Say yes, yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Lead me, instruct me. I want to follow you. Father, I pray, let the church arise. Lord, let us stand out in this post-pandemic world as a people that are strong in their conviction for God, strong in their walk with God, who love God and love people. Lord, I pray, receive that commitment, Lord, that you've heard from each one of us today in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, hallelujah.